Our speaker for today will not be a face or a name well known to you because they are new to St. Peter's. And actually, this is a little bit of a sneak preview because officially, not starting till after Friday, but it's my pleasure to introduce Bob, Bob Barstow, who's going to be a new associate vicar here at St. Peter's. So we're going to have a chance to kind of learn a bit more about you and welcome you once you are officially licensed. In the Church of England, has to be an official licensing. And this Friday, if anybody wants to come, 7.30 here at St. Peter's, Bob will be licensed and you will see him in his full regalia, as you will the rest of the clergy too. And Bishop Martin is coming to license him. So this is a sneak preview, isn't it? And we're going to get to know you very well over the next few years. And we're so delighted that you're here. And Thanks, you're speaking Helen. this morning. I Thank am you. speaking. But I know like most churches, kind of like you're looking around on a Sunday, you're like, who's going to talk? He, he can do it. He'll see, we'll just sneak him in. So I think that's maybe why I'm here. Um, I'm married to Helen. We have uh, two kids who are um, currently in the kids' room doing some kind of craft. So any, anyone who's looking after their kids and it's like the end of the summer and you're like, school can't start soon enough, um, I feel your pain and your joy that school will start very soon. Um, um, it's been really good. It's been amazing to be welcomed by everyone here. Helen and I and the kids, we moved in two weeks ago and uh, the, the removal guys turned up uh, with the, like our stuff and they kind of left it all and we were just surrounded by boxes. That was all we knew. And then loads of people from church just turned up and they were like, oh, we're here to help. We were like, you've probably got the wrong house. Like, help what? Uh, and they're like, well, you help you unpack. So people built our beds and emptied our, some of our boxes. And um, it's been so great to meet so many of you. We met so many of you at Focus as well. And uh, it, it's, thank you for an amazing welcome. Today, I want to talk to you about restoration, about restoration. How are you doing at the end of summer? Maybe you're feeling alive, ready for September. Hands up if you're like ready for September, ready for the new term. I've, I saw one of these. Um, maybe you're feeling a little bit like me and you're feeling, you, you know, if you do, if you do exercise, um, summer comes and then barbecues happen and late nights happen and we've just moved. So we've been living off biscuits and coffee for the last month or so. And you just feel a bit kind of floppy and you're in need a bit of a restoration, a bit of... Uh, bit of like strength again, but you kind of feel weak. Maybe it's something a little bit more serious than that, like frustration or anxiety or uh, a relationship that's, that's gone wrong. And, and you look back at, maybe it's the start of summer, but it might be a season in your life and you're thinking, maybe I could get that back. But it feels like a distant dream. The hope of restoration just feels like a dream that would never really come true. I grew up in the northwest of England and it's a brilliant place. Um, and I went to a sixth form when I was 16. And in the sixth form common room, there was a CD player. Now a CD player is a little bit like a wireless speaker, just in case you needed to know that. And the CD player, Every lunchtime, every break time, every free period would be blaring out music. And the music sounded a little bit like this. This was the soundtrack of my 16, 17, 18 year old self, Oasis. Come on. Did anyone get tickets? No. Someone got tickets. No, no one got tickets. So for me, Oasis were the soundtrack of my youth. And when they eventually split up, I was gutted. Not gutted because I'm like one of these zany One Direction fans. But I was, I was gutted because I'd never seen them live. And I'd always wanted to go and see them live. Fast forward 15 years later, and this week the news comes out that they're getting back together. And I'm thinking maybe I could get some tickets. I've got not much, but a little bit more financial clout than when I was 16. So I can, I can kind of 
go and sign up and I'll, I'll have a go. But as I was waiting there on Saturday for yesterday, for hours and hours, the hope of getting tickets to Oasis felt a little bit like this. It felt like I would never get tickets. And in the end, there was absolutely no chance I was ever getting any tickets to see Oasis. The hope of restoration felt like a dream that was never going to happen. It was a dream that I, I, was, I was never going to get. But there are other things in my life, if I'm really honest, personal things that I want restored. There are things in my life that I want to be restored. And this isn't just something that we think about individually. Restoration is not just an individual thing. It, it, it's communal as well. I was driving along the seafront the other day and I noticed the old pier in, in the sea and the wind was blowing, the rain was coming in, uh, but the sun was kind of breaking through the clouds and shining just, just around near where the pier is. And I thought about this amazing city that we've just moved to two weeks ago that many of you guys are been living in for years and years and I thought it's such a great place but there is need of restoration in this city and it's not necessarily the pier that, that's, that's kind of old broken down in the sea but there's that fabric of society stuff that, that feels like it's in need of restoration. It, it could be addiction or broken ambition or, or like pleasure that's just been twisted slightly so it's kind of gone wrong and, and in our city we long for restoration, for the light to break through the clouds and for restoration to come. Well, the good news today is that God is working to restore you and me. He's working to restore this city. God in heaven has bent his will towards restoration. It's what he does. It's how he works. And that restoration might be closer than you think today. Um, I said I'm married to Helen and we've got two kids. We've been living in central London for about six years. Um, and over the last season, the last little few months of our life, we've been thinking, planning, praying a bit about coming here. Uh, and the passage of scripture that's been on, on my mind quite a lot recently is Psalm 126. So psalm 126 is a psalm that God's people would have sung in the Old Testament as they journeyed on their way up to Jerusalem, on their way home to their holy city. They'd have sung it as they went through these dangerous roads down from the Dead Sea, as they journeyed up the hill, up to Jerusalem. And it was as if they were singing these songs, singing this song, Psalm 126, as they were going to their heaven on earth. And as we as a family have been moving down here, down into heaven on earth, Brighton and Hove. We, I've been thinking a little bit about this song and this psalm. We're in a summit series at the moment at St. Peter's called Songs for the City. Uh, and we've been looking at some of the psalms and we're trying to work out what the song is in each, in each psalm. What's the song for us today as a church and for our city? What ancient truth can we kind of pull out of these psalms and draw away from them for, that we can sing over our lives today, that we can sing over this city? Uh, and last week, Hannah spoke on Psalm 16 and building your, our lives on Jesus Christ. And today, as we journey into this city, down to St. Peter's, right in the heart of Brighton, let's read Psalm 126. The words are going to come up on the screen. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we're filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Restoration is closer than you think. So how is it closer than you think? 
Well, in the song of Psalm 126, we have three things that are given to us. Three things to hang, hang this Sunday on, I guess. Firstly, we have a prayer. We have a prayer in this psalm, something to cling on to. Interestingly, when, when you read this psalm, there's, there's tension in it. In, in the Old Testament uh, translation, there are geeks who translate the Old Testament. There's two schools of thought on this psalm. One is uh, that it's translated in the past tense. So making it a statement of something that has happened. So as we've just read it then, when the Lord restored our fortunes, wasn't it great that the Lord restored our fortunes? Wasn't it great that God sorted out our lives? And you kind of look back with thanks. Thank you, God, that you've sorted everything out. But some translators would translate it in the future tense. So something that's going to happen. It would then read a little bit like this. God, restore our fortunes. Come and help. And maybe you're in a position where you're looking at your life and you're saying, wow, I used to be like that, but now I'm like this. God has really put my life back together. And you, you look back with thanks. But maybe you're in a position where you kind of wish he would help you now and, and you, you're thinking, God, would you put my life back together, please? I, I need your help now. But to think about that feels like something that would never come to fruition. So you pray, God, help me out. God, restore me. And that's the tension that we have in this psalm. God has helped us. God, help us. And that's the tension we're often in today because really, I think we're often in both of those camps, aren't we? God has helped us. Look, my life is being put back together. Maybe it's, it's for someone else. Like I've seen these addictions broken. I've seen friends' lives changed, people brought in. We've seen amazing things happen in this church over the last 15 years. We've joined in with a city beginning to be restored. And our prayer is, God, help us out. Put my life back together. Heal my friend's addictions. Heal my friend. Bring them into your family. Restore this city. Put it back together again. And we, as a people of God, people here at St. Peter's on the 1st of September, as we start the new term, we have a prayer that says, God, thank you. God, help. We have a prayer. Secondly, we have a model. Look at how the tension is resolved in the second half of the psalm. Verses five and six says this, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. A sheave, if you've never um, harvested in your life, is a big pile of wheat, which is... Um, what makes most cereals happen. People would have gone out and they would have harvested sheaths of wheat and then money's in, cash is in. We can, we're going to eat today. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing that they have sheaves. That's resolving the tension of that. And, and this resolving of tension is often how, always how God works. Tears to songs of joy, sadness to happiness, weakness to strength, weeping to rejoicing, anxiety to peace, stress to tranquility. Bad things come good. And the ultimate example of that tension being resolved is at the heart of the Christian faith in the person of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, writing a letter to the church in Philippi in the New Testament, so hundreds of years after this psalm was written, he said this, Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It goes on, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
in heaven and on earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus, who is God, who had all of the wealth, all of the power, all of the status that God gets, that's like the most you could ever imagine. He gave up his position, his place, his status, and he came down into the valley, the broken places of the world, the broken places that you see on your way to work or on maybe on your way to church, or maybe the broken places that you know exist in your life. He went down into that place, into the floppiness at the end of summer, into your frustration, your anxiety, your stress, down even into your illness and maybe even to your death. He went down there to your lowest low. His ambition, his position, his place, his hopes and his dreams, they died with him on the cross. But because he went to the lowest low, God raised him up from the dead. And in a moment, as Jesus rose from the dead, there is hope for the whole world. The Apostle Paul later in another letter to Romans, he uses this phrase, in Christ. He also uses the phrase, Christ in you. And if you call yourself a Christian, if you want to call yourself a Christian, it's like you're in Christ. So what happens to Jesus happens to you as well. So as Jesus dies, your old life dies with him. But as Jesus rose, your life rises with him. You get a new life. The Christian life is modelled on a journey from life to death to life again. It's modelled on the life of Jesus. And it's through the cross that God's spirit really works in your life and in my life. It's in Jesus' death that new life comes about. And that is how God restores. We can see it in the psalm. It's weeping to rejoicing. So because of Jesus, your weakness can become strength. Your frustration can become satisfaction. Your anxiety can become peace. Your stress, tranquility, your stopping, starting, your giving, receiving, your weeping, rejoicing, your sowing to reaping, your sadness to songs of joy, your death even to life. That is a dream that is coming true. So what do we do? How do we respond to that? Well, if you notice in Jesus, his restoration, his back to life, it wasn't, it doesn't, he, Jesus didn't make a plan for restoring his life. He didn't think, well, I've died now. So um, what's my like five year plan for, you know, resurrecting this career or this life or um, that relationship? God raised him up. And he, his restoration is tied up in restoring others, in restoring you and me today, actually in restoring the whole world. So for you and me today, to bring about restoration in our lives, we're to follow in the model of Jesus by going about to restore other people's lives. That could be something as simple as taking a first step by joining a team at church does not just to make up the numbers, but by following in the model of Jesus, we're giving out for others. Safe Haven has been running here for years and years, and it's a way of giving ourselves for other people. It might just be a Sunday team or kids team at church, which is starting up next week. But it might be something slightly different. It might be a position that you have at home. Maybe you're like a partner, husband, wife, and um, you know that you need to give up something. Maybe, it's part of, maybe you need to spend more time at home doing something else, taking on a bit more of the administration of running a house. And you know that's gonna, act, that's gonna impact your career a little bit, or it might impact some hobbies that you have. That might be what it is for you. Maybe it's a friend, uh, a relationship you have with someone you know who needs some help. Maybe they might need a little bit of money or some of your time. And you know, actually, to give that to them, it might hurt a little bit. 
But the encouraging thing about this message is that it doesn't rely on you by yourself. You're not isolated. It wasn't just one person singing this song on a road up to Jerusalem thousands of years ago. There are groups of people, a whole people, a whole nation would sing this song together as they've journeyed up, journeyed up together. So we don't do this alone. We don't do it in isolation. And we don't do it in isolation right now because we're joining in with a story that's gone before us and it's going to go ahead of us. And a good example is our church, St. Peter's here today. It's not up on a hill, but it's kind of down in a valley. And many of you know the story of this church. It was due to be closed down 15 years ago. A small group of people moved here and they prayed. And they prayed that God would restore this place. They invited people in to meet with him. They served with the poor. And if you look at the roof here today, uh, one of the first pieces of work that had to be done to make this space a decent space for inviting people in to serve with the poor was to fix the roof because it was falling in. And you can see signs of where it's all been fixed. And, and us today, we get to sit under this roof and we think, great, we've got a roof that's not going to fall on our heads, which is quite encouraging when you think about that. But these guys prayed and prayed. And then us here today, we're joining in with that story. We're praying for the restoration of this city together. We're pr- a, a, a visible sign of that, if you like, might be the, the scaffolding coming down from the tower. It's like a visible sign of God's restoring. But more than that, we're concerned with the people who live here. We're concerned with those who might need some of our time or care, our, 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 maybe even our money. This might hurt a little bit. We might get dirty knees, a bit dusty on the shoulders. But this is the model of Jesus. It's to give away so that others are restored. And in giving away, we are restored as a people as well. But we serve Jesus Christ, the one who went lowest for us so that others might be lifted up and restored. We do it together. And we're rewriting, as we're doing this, these songs for our lives. And we're rewriting these songs for our city as well. This dream, it's not a dream that feels distant. This is a dream that's coming true. In the person of Jesus Christ, we have a model to follow. And finally, the third thing is that we have a hope. And we have a hope because we don't do this together in vain. These people thousands of years ago singing Psalm 126, singing these songs on their way up to Jerusalem, they were pointing to a present reality that God has saved them, but they were also pointing to a future reality that one day God would come back and he would restore their lives. He would restore them. Then he would restore the whole world. And so for us, the cross is proof of God's restoration. It's proof that he has done it, but it's also proof that he's going to come again and make every wrong thing right. He'll return. He'll restore our lives. He'll restore this city. He'll make every sad thing come untrue. He'll make every wrong thing come right. The dream of restoration is coming true. 